I know that a lot of people uh, have commented to us over the years that, you know, they don't do end times. They don't talk about end times because they find it too deep, too hard, too extreme, too fundamental. And uh, I just wanted to address this very briefly. We have here Dr. James Dobson recently said the fall of Western civilization is at hand. Would you call Dr. James Dobson, uh, founder of Focus on the Family, a bit too extreme? No. He's a pretty even-keeled, respectable voice in the body of Christ. And if you're not listening to us, maybe you would listen to him. Because he discerns the time. And there are many voices in the body of Christ that is discerning the time. I know that there are many Christian channels out there and you can watch anything, but of all the things to be watching, all the things to be promoting and plugging, I just recently saw, you know, some Christian um, sent out a thing that said, you know, these are like the five best YouTube channels out there, recommends them, and, uh, you know, some of them have like 2,000 followers, 8,000 followers, and I'm not bagging that, you know, we all have to start somewhere, but I'm thinking, hang on a second, you know, we're, we're at 100,000 followers, but why do we not always get the, you know, accolades of our fellow peers? Because there's such a fear and such an anti-end time sentiment among the church. It's almost as if people feel like, oh, if it's the end time, we can't live. We never said that. If, it's, if your God called you to study, you study and get the best grades. And if you do that, you pass your exam and Jesus comes back, you'll get your reward. If you're supposed to, you know invent something, build a building, develop property, whatever it is that you're supposed to do, raise your kids, all right? If you do that to the best of your ability and you're obeying God in your call, it doesn't matter really when he comes, you will be rewarded for obeying him and being faithful to him. So we never have this fatalistic teaching. I think our church people understand that, but a lot of people out there are afraid. So when it's end time, they right away they prejudge. First they say it must be about when the rapture is. We hardly talk about that. Today we will. Um, and then a lot of people just get afraid like they can't live uh, today. No, I think Dr. James Dobson is aware that we still have to build wonderful, strong, healthy Christian families in the church. We want to do that, right? Even if it's the end time. Yeah? And he's doing that and he's built a great organization, but you can't turn a blind eye and just say, oh, nothing is happening, none of the signs are here, everything is going as it ever was since the, since the creation of the world. That would be absolute blindness. We need to wake up to the time, like the ten virgins were asleep, we need to wake up. How about this respectable man of God, Billy Graham? You know, he wrote, or he published in 2010, and I think 2010 was a key year in the end times. Right, the Haiti earthquake, many things happened in 2010 that seemed to be a pivot point. And interestingly, Billy Graham, who's been soul winning, you know, more than most of us, right, all these years, he signaled that 2010 storm warning. Do you call Billy Graham a bit extreme? All right, I, I don't, you don't, you know, maybe somebody does, but I think most people don't. I think he's been a, one of the very uh, respected voices for the body of Christ. And he said this back in 2010, there is only one answer to the travail of this present age, and it is found in the ageless pages of God's Word, the Bible. The Bible repeatedly tells us that someday Christ will return, not in weakness, the way he came the first time, but with power and glory and with great authority. We should be teaching our people Jesus is coming back. His return is near. We don't have to be dogmatic about when, but we shouldn't be completely oblivious to the signs of the time. That's how many people miss the first coming of Jesus Christ. What a tragedy that was. Then Billy Graham updated what he said in 2013 to World Net Daily. He wrote, There's a great deal to say in the Bible about the signs we're to watch for and when these, signs are, uh, when these signs all converge at one place, we can be sure that we're close to the end of the age. And those signs, in my judgment, are converging now for the first time since Jesus made those predictions. Are we on some fringe? Are we on a tangent? Is this some fundamental crazy thing? Hey, 
the leaders of the body of Christ are crying out. We're sounding the shofar. And I hope pastors out there who've been turned off or maybe uh, were disappointed back in the 80s or the 70s and heard so much teaching and nothing happened, please never be turned off to prophecy. This is part of God's Word. And prophecy is given to encourage us and also to prove God's Word is true and to encourage us that He's coming soon. We should live like that. So I think this is a bit extreme. To see all that God is doing and to see all that the devil's doing, to see the persecution of the Christians in the Middle East, the absolute chaos that's going on, uh, reaching even into Europe, and terrorism going on everywhere, even in Australia. And to say, welcome to nobody cares. Planet Earth, nobody cares. We're all indifferent. We come to church. We don't care when the rapture could possibly happen. We don't care. I think that it, that is such an extreme. That is a personal extreme, a theological extreme. It is such an extreme risk to take to say, I will ignore all the warning signs. I'm just going to keep bulldozing ahead, like running towards a cliff and not caring about how I live my life now. That to me, in my humble opinion, that to me is too extreme for me to follow. verse 15 is one of the most important uh, prophetic hints of the Messiah. Moses said on his last day, Deuteronomy is one sermon preached by Moses on his last day of life before he died. Deuteronomy 18 verse 15, the Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like me from your midst, from your brethren. Him you shall hear. Most people understand that this is a messianic prophecy. Moses says, someone is coming after me. And instead of listening to me, you're going to be listening to him. Now, to the Jews, there's no one greater than Moses. He's the greatest. So Moses already said, you're going to hold me in high esteem. However, don't do that. You're going to have somebody else come after me. Now, what does that mean? He describes the person. A prophet like me, if, like Moses, would mean that he would have to be rejected the first time. Do you know that when Moses went back with the call of God burning in his heart and he tried to deliver a Jewish man from his oppressor, his Egyptian oppressor, the Jews said, who made you a ruler over us? And rejected him and then he fled into the desert for 40 years. He tried to save the Jews at the age of 40 and he didn't come back. He was rejected and he didn't come back until he was 80. Think about that kind of rejection. That's a long time, right? Why? Because it represents the Messiah coming the first time and the Jews crucified him and rejected him. And then a long time after, 2,000 years later, many Jews coming to realize, oh, we're treating the Messiah just like we treated, our ancestors treated Moses. So if you're reading your Bible, your Torah, you would know a prophet like Moses has to be rejected the first time he comes. Moses goes back a second time to the same people when he's at age 80 and then they accepted him. It gave him a hard time, but accepted him after the ten plagues. Moses also said the Messiah will be from your brethren. That means he will be Jewish. In fact, he'll be from the tribe of Judah. Now, this was literally fulfilled if you were standing there and waiting for who's the next person I'm going to follow after Moses. It was literally fulfilled by a disciple of his, a protege of his, named Joshua in English. But his name is not Joshua in English. In Hebrew, it is Jehoshua. Jehoshua. That comes from two Hebrew roots, Jehovah with the Shua, which is salvation. So Moses commissions Joshua, his young protege, to carry on the work and uh, take the Jews into the promised land. The thing is, the word Jehoshua in Hebrew is translated into Aramaic as Yeshua which is translated into Greek as Jesus. And so, the name itself tells you who the Messiah is going to be. The Messiah is going to be from your brethren. However, his identity is going to be divine because God is our salvation. He will be Jehoshua. He will be God our Savior. 
Now, what did Joshua do? Joshua did what Moses could not do, which is to bring the Jews into the promised land. What did Jesus do? Jesus did what the law, represented by Moses, could not do. He saved us from our sins so that he can bring us into heaven. The prophet the Jews are supposed to listen to after Moses was literally Joshua in the first generation, but prophetically, it is Yeshua for all eternity. That is the person that Jews will follow. But the sooner they come to recognize that, the sooner they will be free. God pre-planned Joshua's name to give all Jews a big clue. This is the clue who's going to be the Messiah, Yeshua. Can be no other, no other person but God's Son himself. So, Yeshua is the Messiah. And this is the message of the New Testament. If Jews didn't realize that, we're not anti-Semite, we're not anti-Jews at all. We believe in a Jewish God, Jewish patriarchs, Jewish Bible, and a Jewish Messiah. And this is what the New Testament records several times. Acts chapter 18, verse 28, he, Apollos, refuted the Jews with powerful arguments in public debate using the scriptures. He explained to them that Yeshua was the Messiah. He said in Hebrew, it's Yeshua. He said in Greek, it's Jesus. Again, in Acts 17, verse 3, he, Paul, explained the prophecies and proved that the Messiah must suffer and rise from the dead. He said, this Jesus I'm telling you about is the Messiah. That's the message of the New Testament. It's not anti-Jew. It's fulfilling every Jewish longing. Yeshua is the Messiah. And Paul was a Pharisee, a real great theologian who studied under Gamaliel. Uh, one more, Acts chapter 9, verse 22, Saul just got saved. And Saul's preaching became more and more powerful and the Jews in Damascus couldn't refute his proofs that Yeshua was indeed the Messiah. And we know one of the proofs is Isaiah 53. Any Jewish person listening to this, you can open to Isaiah 53 and read a description about Jesus. Some of the rabbis have reinterpreted that as not one person being described but the whole nation of Israel. But read that in context and ask the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, to explain it to you. You'll see it cannot be a group of people that suffered for the sins of the world. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we were healed. The Jews never suffered stripes so that other people would be healed. It was one human being, divine in nature, who suffered as the Messiah for the sins of the world. His name is Yeshua. Okay, so before I get to the Donald Trump prophecy... We want to make sure that everyone knows Jesus, Yeshua, as Messiah. All right, so let's bow our heads. If you'd like to accept Jesus or Yeshua as Messiah, your Savior, your forgiver of sins, please pray this prayer together with all of us. Say, Dear Yeshua, I repent for rejecting you. Today I accept that you are the Messiah, the long-promised one, the long-awaited one, Thank you that by your stripes we are healed. By your sacrifice we are atoned. Our sins are washed away. We don't need a temple sacrifice. We no longer have a temple in Jerusalem because you sacrificed your life for us. You are my final sacrifice so I can be set free from death Sin. Today we want to talk about the end of evil and the end of suffering on this earth. I think that is a, generally a good thing. If you've experienced evil and injustice, if you've seen war especially, and terrorism, I think you would gladly welcome the end of evil. If, however, you're on the other side and you are perpetrating terrorism and evil and injustice, obviously this is terrible news for you. So what is good news to one becomes bad news to others. And what we get right now is a window of opportunity to decide which side we're on. We can decide whether we're going to choose to go the wrong way after hearing this. If you realize that it's the wrong way 
and you stay, then there is, at the end of that, judgment for those who do evil. And that would have to include us if we're involved in evil, unfortunately. But if we change our way, and if we seek God with an earnest heart, and follow his son, whose name is Jesus, then the end is a very good thing for us. All right? So, the person who will bring an end to evil on this earth is called the Messiah. That's who he is. The Messiah, the Christ in Greek, the Messiah in Hebrew, the Anointed One or the Savior in English. That's his role. The coming of Messiah originally meant the destruction of tyrants and terrorists, of corrupt leaders and evil dictators. That's originally the understanding that the Jewish people had. In fact, they were so convinced of this that when Jesus refused to topple the Roman government immediately and refused to do away with what everybody agreed was a wicked and tyrannical government system, then they were so disappointed they actually even killed him. And Judas, one of the twelve who followed him closely and knew his miraculous working power, just thought, nice that you're healing people, nice you're opening blind eyes, nice that you're raising people from the dead, but you're not really doing the job of the Messiah. Can you understand that? Now, 2,000 years later, Christians have changed the meaning of the coming of Messiah to mean the bringing of peace. Now when we think of Jesus Christ, we can only think of Him bring, bringing love, joy, and peace into our lives. And the very idea that He would bring judgment and correction, and He would level out you know, the injustices of this world, He would eradicate it, He would deal with it. That very idea has almost become foreign to who Jesus is. But the original meaning of who Jesus is has never changed, and he still is coming back to right the wrongs. Now, it's true on a personal level that Jesus brings peace. By us doing teshuva, which is the Hebrew word for repenting and believing in his name. His name is Yeshua, Jesus. By us doing teshuva, we have peace with God. We are reconciled. Our sins have been forgiven. Say with me, all my sins are forgiven. All my sins have been forgiven. You need to be convinced of that. Jesus really has done that. All right? And it brings peace, absolutely. However, the Messiah is still coming back to end all evil on earth. The question is, how? And this is quite a serious matter, and God has reserved it to the very end. God is not a God who's quick to judge. In fact, he says that he's not happy with the, the death of the wicked. It doesn't please him to judge the wicked. And that's why it's actually taken so long for him to come back and judge. So we need to find out how it will end. The Bible ex is explicit. The Bible is clear that there will be a fire judgment. A fire judgment. This is clear from many scriptures, but it begins really in Genesis chapter 9. The reason for the, the fire judgment is because of a promise that God made to his servant Noah. In chapter 9, verse 11, after Noah and his family got off the boat, the ark, uh, after there had been a global flood, he said, I will establish my covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. I have set my rainbow in the clouds, and it will be a sign, the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. So what does the rainbow mean? A covenant between God and the earth. And what has happened is people with a homosexual agenda have taken a godly symbol and defiled it and corrupted it. We'll come back to that next week. Third time, God said, never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. You can't imagine that if you were Noah at that time, you would have been terrified by any hint of bad weather. To you and me, rain is a blessing. Fills our rivers, grows our crops. 
But as far as Noah's concerned, rain was death, mega death, global death. And so God did something very wonderful for Noah. It doesn't have the same meaning for us today. We just see a rainbow and we think that's pretty. But you have to put yourself in Noah's shoe to understand how meaningful this was. God said, the very thing that brought judgment, I'm going to make it beautiful. Things that have caused you mourning, I'm going to turn it to rejoicing. Something that brought you sadness can now bring you gladness. And so God put colors in the sky. Evidently, this does not, did not exist before. And he put colors in the sky and said, Noah, every time you're, you know, go into like uh, a panic attack or you're shocked by, you know, raindrops, remember, I will never again, three times, never again, never again judge the world by a global flood.